I've clicked on the live stream. So if you just want to give me a couple seconds, I just want to make sure this live stream connects and that there's no connectivity issues. For sure. Thanks, Brandy. No problem. All right, friends, you're good to go. Have a great meeting and I'm here if you need me. Thank you, Brandy. Really appreciate it. All right, welcome everyone uh, to the November meeting of the Active Transportation and Sustainability Advisory Committee. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that many of us, uh, not all of us, are gathered on the territory of the Anishinaabe people, uh, which include the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations, uh, who are collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. Um, this land is also covered by the uh, Williams Treaties of 1923 uh, and is Chippewa Tri-Council territory. And uh, I like to, as, as a settler myself, I like to remind myself of the uh, history and ongoing impact of colonialism on this land and the role that Indigenous peoples and nations have played in uh, steward stewarding uh, the land as we work in this uh, field of sustainability. Um, with that, uh, welcome everyone, and let's do a round of introductions uh, since we have some new faces here. So uh, my name is Keenan Owen. I'm the chair of the committee, and I'm the Ward 2 Councillor for the City of Barrie, and uh, we'll do it popcorn style. So I'll, I'll pass it off to someone, and then they can pass it off. They can choose who introduces themselves next. I'll pass it off uh, to John. Go ahead, John. Thanks, Ken. I'm John Northcote. I'm a resident of Barrie and a committee member, and I'm also a transportation engineer. Uh, and I'll pass it off to Sherry, who I haven't seen in a while. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Sherry Diaz, and I'm a public health nurse. Um, I'm a member of this committee and represent the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit. And I'll pass it off to Kelly. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Kelly Patterson McGrath. I'm also a member of this committee and a resident of Barrie, and I'm excited to have uh, Mike and Mike here today from uh, Guelph Active Transportation. Thank you, I'll pass it off to Brett. Oh, you're on mute, Brett. Always somebody, right? <laughs> um, I'm Brett Gratrix, Senior Project Manager of Transportation Planning. Um, I'm here as a staff representative, along with my team from SEMA that will be providing a pre presentation on the Bradford Street Corridor EA uh, in, uh, later on in this meeting. Um, but I'll just uh, just introduce them quickly and we'll go back to committee. We have Gill uh, sorry, Gilling Thompson, um, we have Catherine Jim, and we also have Kate Barclay. And I'll pass that on to John. Thank you. Uh, I guess John already introduced himself, so. <laughs> we'll pick someone else. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. Uh, and welcome to the team from SEMA. We're happy to have you here and looking forward to that presentation. Um, all right, I will go to Anne-Marie. See so her waving, so it's perfect. Good morning, everyone. Um, Anne-Marie Kungel, uh, City Councillor for Ward 3. Uh, happy to be part of the work of this committee. And an early morning shout out, I'm not sure if uh, Kevin Rankin is on the phone, but did a great job last night on a motion to council on the tree bylaw. So I'm not sure if we've got time on the agenda, but I'm gonna stick it in here now about um, uh, an update about that, but I'm um, just very happy with how uh, city staff support the mandate of the work that we care about. Thanks for that, Anne-Marie. Um, I'll pass it off to Andy now, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, Andy Pellin with the uh, Executive Director of Living Green Berry. Um, and I have no idea who has already spoken, so I'm not even gonna try and pass it off to anyone. I'll just pass it back to you, Keenan. <laughs> That's totally fine, Andy, thank you. Uh, Wilf, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Good morning, everybody. I am Wilf, apologies. I'm having some technical difficulties with video this morning, but I am here, um, member of this committee and uh, president of the Electric Vehicle Society in Canada. I'm happy to uh, be back. I'm sorry I was uh, not able to attend the last couple of meetings. All good, thanks, Wilf. Uh, and Eric. Good morning, everybody. I am here, sorry, struggling with my video. I don't have a video option on this link. I'm happy to be here. My name is Eric Van Wiesenbeck. I'm a longtime citizen of Barrie, uh, 
very interested in active transportation. I rely on it 100%, so I have some boots on the ground feedback and uh, input for this committee that may prove useful in, in the future. Um, I'm also a, a member on the board for the Barry Cycling Club and very involved with the cycling club, also recreational cycling as well as my active transportation. And I have a great interest and a love for Barry and a great interest of what goes on here and uh, any little bit I can help, I will. That's why I'm here. Nice to see you all. Thanks, Eric. And rest assured, your on the ground experience has already been very beneficial. So we're happy to have you here. Um, okay, and we have uh, Brandy Thompson is here. She's uh, with the clerk's office. I think we all met her a second ago. There's Brandy. Thank you so Hi. much. Yeah, I'm Brandy. Um, I'm a committee sport clerk uh, with the city of Barrie. I've been with the city of Barrie since 2004. Came from PLA. Happy to be here. Glad to be part of the team. Thanks, Brandy. Uh, and I see Maria just popped up on the screen. Happy to see you, Maria. It's been a while. Uh, nice we're just to be back. Yeah, awesome to have you. Um, we're just doing a round of introductions now. So if you'd like to introduce yourself, uh, that would be great. Thanks. Uh, Maria Kavanaugh, I live in uh, Barrie, have uh, been here for probably about uh, 11 to 12 years, uh, have children in the community. Um, I do have some transportation background uh, with my current job, uh, very interested in the active transportation part, obviously, with my kids and just happy, healthy community and um, just happy to join and uh, as we figure out some great initiatives uh, for the city of Barrie. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Maria. Um, and uh, we're going to move right into the agenda and we'll hear more from our presenters uh, when their items come up on the agenda and they can uh, tell us a bit about how they uh, are approaching the issues that we're talking about today. Um, so um, let's start off with the Guelph Coalition for Active Transportation. So I believe that's uh, the two mics. So if you'd like to take it away and introduce yourselves uh, and go ahead. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting us. And uh, I, I spoke with uh, Kelly on the phone. Uh, I feel like it was a, over a month ago um, about this. And uh, we're really, really looking forward to, to presenting on on this topic. Um, so thanks. Thanks for the invite. And uh, yeah, we're both named Mike, so it should be easy. Um, the Mike's from, from GCAT. Mike, uh, anything to add there before we jump into the presentation? Um, doing pretty good, Mike. I'm going to rely on you, of course, to uh, move the slides along. Okay. And uh, do, do I have the ability to share my slides here? Uh, you should. Have you clicked the button? Did it work? Uh, yes. Okay. I see that here. So share screen. And if not, we can get Brandy to give you that permission. Nope. Nope. It's all good here. Okay. All right. So you should be able to see that, right? Yes. Okay. And it's just, just the presentation slides. You don't see the speaker view? No. Yeah. Just the presentation. You got it. Great. Okay. Well, uh, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll start it off. So uh, again, uh, I'm Mike Hager. I'm a volunteer with the Guelph Coalition for Active Transportation. And uh, I'm here with Mike Darman, who's the, the president of, of GCAT. And when Kelly got in touch with us, it was just right after the uh, Bike the Night event. And this was sort of our, our first and Guelph's very own nighttime illuminated group ride that we hosted and it was inspired by a lot of other ones out there. And so uh, she was really interested, sorry, interested in hearing more about this particular event. Um, but we also felt that maybe we wanted to talk about um, really briefly, just our mission and our approach, as well as some of the other events that we put on and particularly some of the successes and, and lessons learned. Um, from this event so that potentially your committee uh, or uh, advisory committee can, can, can look to potentially putting on something similar, um, which would be really exciting for the city of Barrie. So um, we have about 20 minutes plus Q&A, is that right? Or, or should we be a bit more brief? Uh, yeah, actually, do you know what, Mike? I'm sorry to do this. I just got a message from our clerk that um, Item 1.3 needs to be pushed up. So I hate to do this to you, but our oh. cons the consulting team has to go apparently okay. uh, at some no point. So is that okay if we push up that item? I'm really sorry to cut you off. Like yeah, no, 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 totally fine. Totally fine. Okay. Yeah. I'm really, really sorry about that. That's yeah, okay. I, yeah. missed, I missed the message from the clerk about that uh, and kind of barreled through. So that was my bad. That's okay. Um, so we're going to uh, come back to you. I'm really sorry, but uh, we're going to go to the group from uh, from CUNL, uh on the Bradford Street EA since uh, they do have another commitment 
in a bit. Okay, yeah, no problem. Go ahead. And I think Brett wants to introduce that, so. Absolutely, thank you, Mr. Chair, and my apologies to uh, Mike for uh, the, the bump there. Um, uh, so right now, there's good wrong. I just wanted to uh, present to committee uh, a presentation on the Bradford Street Corridor Class Environmental Assessment uh, with a focus on the active transportation facility planning approach. Um, I have the SEMA team here that's leading the project. And what they're going to walk through with you is just a brief overview of the project itself, and then focus on the AT facility selection process, and then open up the floor for discussion for input from the group on the thoughts on what some preliminary options look like for Bradford Street. Um, it's important for the committee to know that this project is a long range uh, planning type project. There's no immediate um, capital planning projects uh, plan for this corridor. Um, really the impetus for this project is to identify opportunities to improve traffic operations at Lakeshore and Tiffin and Bradford and Essa. That's a challenging intersection pair. Understand what the footprint of those improvements may be so that at minimum we're protecting them from development uh, for future implementation. Um, the secondary objective of this court of this project is to examine what this corridor should look like from a long range perspective following recommendations contained in the transportation master plan, which presently identifies this corridor for five lanes um, uh, with buffered bike lanes, but we're here today to talk about the new OTM book 18 and how things have changed. Um, and that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, there's a lot of redevelopment happening on Bradford streets. We want to look at how we can bring that street or at least plan for that street, integrate with that change in land use, um, but also facilitate future expansion. There's some bigger picture questions that are outside the scope of the study and will be looked at a little further uh, in the transportation master plan update. And that includes potential for uh, higher order transit um, on the Bradford street, Bayfield street, Young and Essa corridors and what that may look like. So there may be folks that think about 34 meters as a, as a large corridor, but we're also keeping in mind there may be need for just that long range protection piece when we're, and when we say long range protection, we're thinking um, 2051 horizon or longer, but it's important now to understand that. So we ensure the corridor is protected uh, to give us that flexibility to move in that direction should the uh, technical analysis uh, warrant that. So I'm gonna pass over the floor to the SEMA team and my apologies, I hopefully I didn't take too much of your thunder, um, but I'll let them take over and run through this presentation and then we'll open this up for a, a good discussion on some AT options that we're considering. Great, thanks Brad. And I just wanna make sure everyone is seeing my screen okay and you can hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Perfect. So Brad, thank you for the great introduction. That's a great summary of what this study is about. So through the presentation, I'll be running through some of the points that Brett has mentioned just now. Uh, so just very quickly, um, I am the civil engineering lead uh, representing this project. Uh, Phil Weber, he's our uh, project manager and unfortunately he's not able to join us today, but I'm sure there will be future opportunities where he'll be engaging with this group. Uh, Gilly Thompson, she's with us today, and collectively as a team, we will be happy to answer any questions that you may have on this project throughout the presentation. So as Brad mentioned earlier, uh, the intent of the Bradford Street uh, Corridor EA study really is a long range corridor planning study. Uh, we do see the transformation and the revitalization of the downtown area of Barrie, uh, as you have uh, many of you may have seen already along Lake Shore Road, there has certainly been some changes in land use, and we would be expecting that type of transformation to continue for the years to come. So for this particular study, we are looking into the long term into 2031, 2041, and 2051. What does it mean for transportation needs from a multimodal perspective? And when we say that, we mean not only vehicles anymore, but also for pedestrians, for cyclists, and for transit, as Brett mentioned earlier, um, looking into the, to the corridor. And in particular, because we also have the Allendale uh, waterfront go station here in the proximity of our study area. We foresee that Bradford Street, really along with the Lakeshore uh, corridor as well, to be that primary connection to, uh, to the go station and also to the community. So while we are looking at um, traffic operation improvement and some of these key intersections, particularly at Tiffin Street and also at Lakeshore and, and Essa Road in that area, 
We are also going to be uh, looking at the corridor uh, as a whole, uh, uh, along with these other elements, for example, any streetscape improvement, um, and also any property needs to accommodate future improvement needs on the road itself. Because with um, development coming, we wanted to be sure that, uh, that we're identifying the need for transportation uh, early on so that uh, we'll be able to assist with some of those land use transformations that are going to be happening. So as Brett mentioned earlier, there is no immediate capital works planned at the moment. Uh, so again, this is very long-term. And throughout this study, uh, we do see that there may be opportunities for some of the shorter term uh, capital improvement. So we'll be able to gauge that as we move along on this project. So um, as we mentioned earlier, this is a class environmental assessment studies. There's certainly lots of information on this slides, but what we want to emphasize on is this is basically following a Schedule C uh, environmental assessment process. Uh, so there are four phases all together. Um, and I do want to mention too that before we even begin uh, this EA study, the city has already done a transportation master plan, which follow, uh, generally follow uh, phases one and two of the EA where uh, they have, uh, uh, has already identified some of the improvement on Bradford Street corridor and also some of the proposed solutions. So in the context of the EA study, we wanted to uh, just reconfirm uh, those needs. And, and also uh, move ahead with some of the recommendation as we move into phases um, three and four, uh, phase three being the design alternatives where we will be looking at some of the design element in more detail uh, and then going through some of the evaluation, identify what is most tailored and most suitable for the corridor. In the phase four, we will be preparing an environmental study report where we, we would be um, documenting the decision-making process uh, through the, the EA study. So in terms of study timeline, I just want to note that the study actually commenced in uh, July of this year in the summer. So at this time, we are in phase two where we're looking at the different alternative solutions. We are engaging different stakeholders like yourself today. And also uh, in the near future, we will be planning a public information center, likely in the, in the um, early part of 2022. Uh, and then other timelines is as we get into some of the design decision, uh, anticipated timeline will be around late spring 2022, where we'll be going to the public again uh, for another uh, public information center. And the whole study we're anticipating uh, to, be, to be wrapping up uh, in the fall or winter of next year. So coming from the high level study, I uh, just want to draw our attention again, really the purpose of our meeting is to uh, get everyone's input and, and also to have some discussion in relation to active transportation. So as mentioned earlier, the, the TMP itself identify a proposed cycle track uh, on Bradford Street. Um, so that, that was the element included as part of the translation master plan. Uh, recognizing that the OTM Book 18 focusing on cycling facilities have been updated recently this summer, we wanted to have a look at the current design standard and guidelines and best practices, how that compares to uh, the, the proposal that was identifying the TMP on the Bradford Street corridor. So this is our opportunity to do that. We're really just at the onset of the study. We wanted to start this conversation early. So some of you may be familiar with the uh, OTM Book 18 guideline. Um, so where we want to focus on for active transportation really is the, uh, the notion of um, having the, the triple A, um, all ages and, and uh, being uh, available. So what we're um, focusing on is uh, we would be following the three-step process. So first of all, uh, we would um, be pre-selecting the facility type based on the corridor that we're in. Uh, and then as we uh, get into, like I said before, the phase three of the EA process, we'll be looking into some of the detail in terms of the design uh, within the context of the, of the um, Bradford Street corridor. And then we will be documenting uh, the, the selection of the facility and the design process itself. So we wanted to uh, ensure and, and emphasize to that for the Bradford Street corridor, we wanted to capture active transportation use uh, for the group where we, what we call interested but concerned, because we noticed that that represent the biggest um, population uh, percentage. 
Um, so right now, active transportation use uh, are often being geared towards some of the utilitarian uh, uh, uses, and also you know uh, the lakeshore corridor itself may be more attractive for the recreation user. Uh, we do see Bradford um, corridor functioning in that role to complement uh, the electrical corridor and, and, and providing that connection to the GO station. So again, what we're interested in is trying to attract as many people as we can uh, on active transportation through the transformation of the Bradford Street corridor. So in the step one of our process, we wanted to look at what is the, the right facility type uh, for us. So when we look into uh, OTM book 18, uh, it has identified that streets with two or more through lanes in each direction um, should have a buffer bike lane or a buffer paved shoulder, which we consider as a physical separation uh, being preferred. So we are in the category of physically separated bikeway. So as Brad mentioned earlier, um, the Bradford Street corridor is uh, planned to have a 34 meter right of way and also a five lane cross section. So uh, regardless of the posted speed or the traffic volume, we are recommending a physically separated bikeway automatically. And within this category of um, ATUs, uh, the, there are three facility types that we'll be looking at. Uh, so separated bicycle lane, cycle track, or a multi-use path. So that, those are the three types. Um, and in my next slide, I'll be giving you a, a quick uh, definition of what they are. So when it comes to physically separated um, cycling lanes, what it means is it would have a physical barrier on the road element itself that provide a horizontal buffer and also a separation element between the, the cycling lanes and the road traveling itself. So in this picture, you can see an example of a race curve um, separating the travel lane and the cycle, uh, cycling lane itself. So in this case, we're talking about only having that horizontal buffer. In the second AT facility type, we're talking about a cycle tracks. So in this case, we're talking about a physical separation of the bikeway, which is horizontally as well as vertically separated from the travel portion of the road. So for example, it may be separated by a mountable or a barrier curb. And the third facility type is the multi-use path. Um, this may be a one-way or a two-way path that is both horizontally or vertically separated from the travel portion of the road itself. And we often find a multi-use path in the boulevard space. Um, so, and in the case of a multi-use path, it is a shared facility uh, between cyclists and pedestrians. So those are kind of the main differences among the three uh, facility types. And before we get into some of the details, how these facility types may be applied to the Bradford Street corridor, just want to bring us back to the transportation master plan again, just to see how Bradford Street, from an active transportation perspective, how does it fit in the overall road network? So uh, Bradford Street is here uh, in that dotted um, green. So it is proposed to have a future cycle track along the corridor. We do recognize that in the north end, uh, north of Dunlop Street, uh, there will be a, a proposed transition to a signed bike route. And then also on the south end, it's going to be a proposed transition into an in boulevard pathway. So coincidentally, this is also the area where we'll be looking at some intersection improvement. So certainly a lot of attention will need to be made in terms of not only um, how traffic is going to flow, but also how the active transportation use is going to be transitioned in those area. And again, on this map, we also want to point out the waterfront multi-use trail that are along Lake Shore. So these two corridors really do uh, complement each other. So one thing we wanted to highlight uh, as a guidance is the city standard uh, for a 34 meter uh, arterial road. So this is kind of uh, one of the pieces of information and as the basis that we wanted to rely on as we, as we move into the design process. So fundamentally, um, the city's design standard help uh, guide some of the decision on the, the lane, um, divisions between the lane, the center turn lane, and also some of the boulevard elements that may be provided. We do recognize through the EA study and as we identify some of the constraints in the corridor, some of these elements will have to be modified as well to fit our 
uh, to, fit, to fit our tailored need. So the next three sets of slides, um, I will be going through some of the proposed or potential cross section that may be on Bradford Street, looking at the three facility types that I just mentioned earlier, physically separated bicycle lane, um, uh, the cycle track option, and also the multi-use path. So the first slide that we're seeing here is related to the physically separate, separated bicycle lane option. So here, like I mentioned before, we're generally basing it on the 34 meter right of way in combination with some of the guidelines that are provided in, uh, in OTM book 18 uh, in terms of some of the, the dimension. So what, uh, where I want to draw your attention is for the physically separated bike lane, you do have the bike lane on the road itself being separated by a, a physical element, either a uh, flexible bollard or in the case of this picture, you can see planters, so that's where we will be providing separation between the cyclist and the road element. And in this case, we put together a couple of examples where um, you know, the bike lane may be at 1.8 meter, uh, the buffer may be at one meter. So the overall right of way may be up to 36, which is greater than our, uh, the, the identified right of way of 34 meter. Uh, in our second example here also is a physically separated bicycle lane but we have reduced uh, the dimension of the bike lane and also a narrower buffer. So still providing that physical separation, but that brings us, uh, bring our right of way uh, to closer to the, to the 34 meter. So again, here, this is just showing how the same similar elements, but with different dimensions, fits within the right of way. Uh, again, recognizing the, the changing condition along the corridor itself. And we can go back to some of these slides as we, as we get into the, to the discussion. I just want to have a chance to go through the, the three facility types first. Um, so the second um, options we were looking at is the cycle track option. So this, as I mentioned earlier, the cycle track offers both horizontal and vertical separation between uh, cyclists and the road element itself. So in this case, uh, we, uh, in this particular example, we're setting the cycle track next to the travel lane separated with either a mountable or a um, barrier curb. So you can see the uh, horizontal as well as the vertical separation between cyclists and the travel lane. And in this case, uh, the pedestrian is being accommodated through the sidewalk, uh, separated from the cycle track through a boulevard uh, in between where uh, utilities may also be located in that space as well. We also did a variation of the cycle track where it, where it would be set next to uh, the sidewalk. And in this case, uh, it does offer greater uh, separation from the road element itself, but because it is closer to the sidewalk, we are introducing a 0.6 meter buffer as well between pedestrian and cyclist. Again, between these two examples, we are seeing how these elements may be fitted within the proposed right of way and where in some situation where it may go beyond. Uh, so we do have a couple of pictures here as an example. Um, the first one being from, from Waterloo, you can see the, um, the cycle track being next to the road, uh, next to a mountable curb, uh, separated by uh, the boulevard itself, and then you can see the sidewalk. And in this second example, this is from Ottawa, you can see the, the cycle track setting next to uh, the, the sidewalk itself. And the third option we looked at is to in Boulevard uh, multi-use path. So in this case, we have uh, all the active transportation used be being in that shared uh, multi-use path space. Uh, in this case, it is set back from the road element itself separated by a boulevard. And we're proposing a four meter multi-use path um, on both sides of the road itself. And in this uh, slide, you know, we're showing some examples Again, from Waterloo, from Richmond Hill, and also from the town of Newmarket. Really, uh, when it comes to multi-use path, it can be a range. Um, whether the, the cyclist you know, can be on, on both ways. And in this case, you see uh, a shared uh, facility between cyclist and pedestrian. And then uh, in the case of Newmarket, this is a two-way uh, facility. Um, and actually, sorry, uh, my apologies. This is a one-way facility, um, a two-way facility for both uh, uh, cyclists as well as pedestrian and clearly marked in this case. Um, the last slide that I also wanted to make 
uh, a point of is actually the, the notion of accommodating a two-way facility on one side of the road. So here is an example of cycle track um, uh, option where you have it on just one side of the road um, and is being separated by boulevard and you have pedestrian accommodated in the sidewalk on, on one side. And then on the other side of the road is just dedicated just for the pedestrian. So again, this is uh, uh, just trying to explain or trying to demonstrate how within the same right of way, there is the option of what if we have a two-way uh, facility just on one side, whereas the previous example, you have the one-way facility on either side of the road. So maybe with that, I'll take a I'll take a pause. This is a lot of information. Just wanted to, to see the reaction from uh, from the group here and what are some of the initial input you may have on these proposed uh, facilities and different options, really. And and just before I turn that over to uh, the chair, just want to thank uh, the committee again for having us in. Um, and the purpose here is just uh, to gather any preliminary feedback. There's obviously the opportunity when we have our public information center to uh, provide more formal feedback if the committee uh, desires uh, as a committee or as individual uh, residents, that's totally uh, available to you folks. Uh, we definitely didn't expect just to drop this on you and expect a, 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 fi a finality of comments from you folks, but we just wanted uh, to put this in front of committee uh, to start um, getting you folks thinking about some options we're looking at. And uh, just if you had any thoughts or feedback to the group, that would be great. But again, we're always open to receiving feedback anytime after this. Nothing's going to be decided uh, uh, really until uh, we're well past PIC number one. So there's lots of time to uh, provide feedback. So I'll just pass that over at this time. Okay. Thank you, Brett. Um, and uh, I'm hoping we can get a copy of these slides circulated to the, to the committee as well. Um, is there any more information in the presentation to go over? Just because I'm, I'm very cognizant of the fact that we pushed off a, a presentation and I'm wondering if we can hold the discussion uh, until after we allow our, our guests who have so graciously volunteered their time to be here to, to present. Is that okay if we if we do that? Yeah, what we could do is definitely, I can, uh, I can let the uh, consultant team go and I can field questions later on in the committee meeting today. That's totally fine. Okay, I, I really appreciate yep. that. Yeah, I just wanted to be uh, respectful Absolutely. of Mike and Mike who are, are, who are volunteers. Uh, so uh, yeah, we're so happy to have them here. Okay, so thank you so much to the consultant team. Thank you, Catherine, for presenting uh, very interesting options and we'll have a discussion and, uh, uh, and provide some feedback on, on what you've presented. So thank you so much for being here. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Right. Everyone. Take okay. care. Okay, okay. bye-bye. Okay, so we'll hold on the discussion for now and uh, we will pass it back to Mike and Mike who I so rudely cut off earlier. So uh, thank you again and uh, take it away. Not a problem, Keenan. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. And, and no, it was really interesting following some of that, some of that, uh, that research and uh, you know the, the various options for different uh, uh, bike facilities. And uh, you know we'll talk a little bit about that in our presentation as well. But um, yeah, we'll we'll jump into it. So uh, let me just share my screen. And just to confirm with you, um, just uh, we don't want to run over time. So um, what was the allotted? We'll try to get through yeah, it and yeah, like. You could Take about 20 minutes if okay. that works Excellent. for you. Yeah, That's great. Yeah, okay. sounds good. So I'll share screen again. Here we are. Okay. Um, so again, th thank you uh, to the committee for, for inviting us. Um, it's exciting to, to present on the successes of, of the bike the night. Um, as I mentioned, we... Um, we did want to kind of uh, briefly touch on uh, a little bit of a, our mission and our approach, just so you know who GCAT is and what we do and how we sort of fit within the community. Um, we're not an advisory council, we're an independent uh, nonprofit advocacy organization. Um, and then talk about our events and, and, and maybe what the city of Barrie can, can learn from those. So I'll pass it off to Mike to talk about, talk about GCAT. Thanks, Mike. Um... I'm not sure exactly what you want to get into in discussion today. This is mostly around the Bike the Night uh, event, I'm assuming. So I won't elaborate too much on what we do and all that sort of stuff. But our, our mission is, to, basically our mission is to increase the quantity, quality, and um, of active transportation infrastructure in Guelph. So Mike, uh, actually in this first slide, you can actually see uh, what we actually do is get involved with various city projects, 
And this one was actually um, a separated bike lane pilot study by the city of Guelph. That's actually me on my bike right there. So um, um, let's go on to the next slide. And the next slide again, Mike. And our city is going through a transportation master plan update as I think you guys are too right now. So we've been heavily involved with that. We've been, we just sent our comments in actually on the second last phase of it just the other day. And we're coming into the implementation stage, which is where we actually want to get really involved um, as an active transportation advocacy group, because that's where we kind of like have our boots on the ground and know what we want. And we want to make sure that we advocate that to the city. And unlike you guys, we don't have, um, like Mike said, we don't have a, um, an advisory group with the city. So it takes a bit of back and forth negotiations to get involved with these discussions. And, and we're actually getting improvements in that area. Um, on the second, you'll actually see on the one of the biggest projects that we want to see into fruition is the bridge below, um, just the transportation master plan, the picture of the bridge. It's the Speedvale Avenue Bridge in Guelph, where we want to get an underpass. That's under our, that, that will actually connect both sides. We have the Trans Canada Trail running through our city. And it's a horrible road to cross. Like it's really busy, fast. And we'd love to get this underpass. And we're making some headway there. Um, there's been all sorts of issues, as you can imagine, with floodplain issues, official plan issues, but we're working uh, to move that forward too. Next slide, please, Mike. And that's some resources. Next slide again. Uh, this is a, actually one project you may be interested in um, doing something similar in Barrie. I don't know if you have something like this or not, but we started this project actually a couple of years ago. It's um, Bikes for Community Connections. And it's a project that gives free bikes away to newcomers to our country. And because of COVID, of course, we got extremely delayed in this. And we had lots of partners involved, in, including um, immigration services, the University of Guelph, and uh, the city of Guelph actually were helping us on this too. But finally this year, after some of the e uh, restrictions with COVID eased up, we finally gave away 11 bikes um, which was way lower than what we were going to do originally, but we at least got the program started. So we're hoping to continue it next year. Um, getting bikes is no problem. There's all sorts of other issues around storage and getting them repaired and getting them certified. And as you can imagine, and then getting uh, people out to receive the bikes and giving some training and mentoring after that. So, but overall, it's a great community type of connection as well to actually have a program like this. So next slide, Mike. So Bike Tonight is mostly being Mike Hager's uh, invention here in a way, and he's done nearly all of the organizing for it. So I'm gonna pass it mostly on to him. And I might pop in with a few comments, but it's really Mike's show here from now on. Thanks, yeah. by the way, thanks Great. everybody for, for inviting us today. Thanks, Mike. And uh, yeah, feel free to interrupt me if you have anything to add. Um, to the slides here, but uh, yeah, so so when Kelly in, uh, invited us to to come and present, it was mainly on the bike the night, and uh, um, I'll show some uh, some videos and some and some photos so you can sort of relive the night, and I'll talk about you know how we did it and also what we learned from it um, in hopes that maybe you can emulate it because that's essentially what we did. We uh, were inspired by uh, similar events across the world. Um, there was one particularly in Barrie that, or sorry, not in Barrie, <laughs> Vancouver. Um, yeah, Vancouver. That was, that was really well done, um, by the hub, which is a, a community cycling advocacy group. Um, and, uh, we thought, you know, their videos and their uh, photos were really great. Um, and some of our uh, board members at GCAT have also participated in bike the night style events in Hamilton and Toronto. Um, so we kind of wanted to do our own in Guelph. Um, really, the, the main goals that we had for this event were to be sort of a fun lit up party on wheels and for ages and all ages and abilities. Um, we really wanted an event that brought community together, especially sort of coming out the, the end of COVID um, and for people to, to gather and to blow off steam and to enjoy the night together. 
And, um, but we also wanted it to be welcoming for people um, who might be uncomfortable riding on the roads or who haven't been to a, a group ride before. So we kind of wanted that to be an introduction to community bike rides and for some uh, cycling on, on city infrastructure. So that was one of our goals. Um, and, and of course, using all types of facilities. So we used um, uh, signed routes, multi-use paths, bike lanes, um, trails that sort of uh, wove through some of the city parks. Um, so we wanted to demonstrate the variety of infrastructure and facilities that were available to cyclists. Um, and then as well, we wanted to advance our organization um, and advocacy for safer, more pedestrian and cycling friendly streets. So sort of providing an opportunity for us to talk about what GCAT does in terms of our, our advocacy on, on the transportation master plan and other infrastructure projects and uh, grow our organization because we're a membership based organization. So the, the, that was sort of the idea and the goals going into it. Um, and now I'll show you what it looked like. So this was um, coming out of the park. Let me know if you can hear this. So of course, as you can see there, and hopefully here there, we uh, we we kicked off the event with Queen's bicycle race, um, and we actually curated a, a whole playlist that we played throughout the ride, just to again have that sort of party atmosphere. And um, here's our, some some of the pictures that came from the event as well. So on the top left, uh, this was just before sunset. So we we met up. Uh, I think it was about six six thirty. People started to arrive, uh, and then we had some. Uh, actually, uh, a local business in Guelph who has a uh, ice cream business that's part of a uh, a trike. So it's a sort of a. Um, a, a bicycle ice cream business. Uh, we had some music and we had some decorations as well set up for people to decorate their bikes if they didn't uh, already. Um, so yeah, we, we tried to make the pre-ride event, you know, entertaining and um, have people come out to that uh, just to meet other cyclists and to, um, you know, to join the event. Uh, further down, we see uh, the, the park starting to get a little bit more full. We weren't really expecting the turnout that we that we ended up with. It was a, you know, quite an overwhelming success for us. Um, and then through to the bottom, we have some of the lights. Uh, actually, the center bottom uh, is our mayor, Cam Guthrie, and his wife, Rachel. And um, they they absolutely loved it. I think, uh, you know, one of the comments from from uh, Mayor Cam was that, uh, you know, it was so nice to have the community back together again. And uh, it, he got a little emotional about it, which was which was kind of nice um, to the uh, bottom right corner. There is actually the covered bridge that goes over the Speed River in Guelph. Um, and incidentally, uh, throughout the summer, they also had some sort of uh, uh, nighttime um programming so they they attach some led lights in the bridge itself that lights up and there's some other um uh, areas in the city as well that that has uh, nighttime lights so it was kind of a, a really nice coincidence that that was going on at the same time uh we ended the ride at city hall and i'll show you the map in a second but we ended the ride at city hall um in, uh, where there is a splash pad and during the winter it's an ice rink but because this was in October, or sorry, September, late September, um, the splash pad was closed, but the ice rink hadn't set up yet. So we actually turned this into a bit of a, uh, you know, a, a, a bike pit. So we sort of circled around it many times and, uh, and then thanked everyone at the end of the ride and uh, everyone went their separate ways. And then the, the top middle picture there is the uh, Guelph sign. So that's at, in, right in front of City Hall. Um, and we tried to take a picture in front of it, but of course you can see it's, it's covered up by all the, all the cyclists. So, um, yeah, so in total, uh, we were expecting something about 
40, 50 people to show up. Um, and, uh, we, we <laughs> ended up and admittedly, this was a little bit over the, uh, the, uh, gathering limits. Um, but about 130 people ended up coming out to the, to the event. Um, we, we did put in place proper COVID safety measures. We were distanced, we were outside when we took photos, we were masked. So we ensured that, you know, um, we were communicating, uh, safety in terms of COVID, but also in terms of cycling. Um, and again, we were not expecting the turnout that we did, um, but we we're super pleased with it. Yeah, Mike, can I throw a couple of comments in on there too? Go for it. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Uh, just to back to that slide again, like uh, you can see the mayor, uh, how happy he is in the bottom middle slide. And he was so excited that next year he wants to have the city uh, coordinate a ride with us. So, you know, it, he wants it much bigger and better, you know, have a kind of a, a party at the end of it. But also, we, I don't know what you have in Barrie, but we have our downtown patio program going. And initially, uh, the first year during COVID, we actually had the two main intersections, intersections closed to traffic, which was great for active transportation and pedestrian feel and everything else. But now we just have it closed on weekends, but we don't know what's going to happen next year. I think it's just going to be probably the same, just weekends. But if we had this in combination with the closed streets and the, you know, the uh, everybody out dining and have a great party, you know, after, because after this ride, honestly, everybody was just, after they circled around the rink many times, people were just waiting for the next thing. And we didn't, we didn't, since we didn't expect all these people to start with, we didn't know what to even say to them, Hey, you know, it's over. You know, we, we needed something after, you know, to uh, continue the fun. Right. Mm -hmm. so, it was an amazing success. Yeah, it was just yeah. an amazing success. Um, we don't we don't fully we don't fully know yet why it was so good, but I guess <laughs> social media. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just back to the poster, Mike. Just quickly, um, the just slide before that. We have a great uh, photographer and uh, artist on our board, and I worked with her on the poster. The initial poster was, you know, it just didn't have the kind of excitement. And this one she came up with was just brilliant. I think it, I think it gives the same feeling as you actually can see later on in the slides, you know, of this um, excitement and, and the look and feel of the ride. So I think that's, if you guys are planning something like that, the poster I think was really key to the, some of the success here. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, certainly. Yeah. 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 Oh, and yeah. And one thing that I forgot to mention actually was uh, um, part of that pre-ride event, um, which I'll touch on kind of in some of the, sort of lessons learned um, was that we, we had a contest as well. So in addition to the decorations and the, the music and, and the vendors, we also had a contest and it was for uh, best lit up bike as well as best costume. So what we had seen at other events is that people love to dress up for these things um, in all sorts of wacky costumes. So we ended up uh, handing out a couple of awards and we engaged some local breweries as well as bike shops to put together some prize packs. So, um, we did it by audience participation. So we got people to self-nominate. They came up, they sort of showed off their bikes or their costumes. And, and we had people sort of, uh, um, give a round of applause for, for, for each, uh, for each cyclist. So again, just another element to the pre-ride event that made it more than just a group ride, but an event that you want to come to and be early for. <laughs> so, um, so, so how we did it. So, um, and this was a bit of the process that we that we um, we we followed. Just uh, I think it was a, only a couple of months of, of preparation for this, but uh, we came up with a vision and the goals for the event, and I sort of shared those with you. Uh, developed a budget. We did have some um, expenses for decorations. Again, if people uh, weren't able to access or afford or have the time to to gather those materials, we did. Um, spend some money on some LED lights and other things and stickers um, and some glow sticks as well. Um, so we did have a budget for that as well as for uh, equipment. So the speaker that you heard, um, that was actually a speaker that we rented from Long and McQuaid and I strapped it to the front basket of my bike um, and it was fine. It, 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 uh, it was, uh, it was a little heavy, but, um, it, it worked out just fine. And, and, uh, you know, I was, I strapped it in very, very securely. So rest assured it was safe. Um, but there was also a budget for that. Um, we also set a, a date and a timeline for the event 
Uh, and, and I think the next point is is important that we we mapped out and we tested and we sort of tweaked the route. Um, like I said, uh, we kind of wanted to be all ages and abilities accessible. Um, and you see here on the slide the map. So it started in Exhibition Park, uh, which is just uh, I guess northwest of downtown, and then we followed the signed bike route down Yorkshire Street here. Um, through towards the river on the, on the bottom of the map, uh, across the, the, the covered bridge, so the covered bridge with the lights, uh, through York Road Park, and then up and through sort of some uh, bike lanes on Gordon Street and then around downtown. And uh, as Mike mentioned, uh, the, the patios were, were quite busy at that time. So part of the idea was, of this was to sort of be a visual statement of the power of, of, of bikes in the city, um, the fact that we use the roads, the fact that we exist, and um, to kind of just have a visual impact. So when we rode by all the bars and patios along downtown, um, people were just shocked and amazed and, and were yelling at us like, what is this? Um, so hopefully we'll have some, some future attendees for, for the next event. Um, yeah, again, we organized the pre-ride event. I stress the importance of having a sort of a pre-ride um, event to attract people to come. Uh, we also secured some sponsorships and partnerships to help draw in people. And that was, again, through prize packs uh, for the contest, as well as just people to help spread the word. So we had uh, a number of uh, cafes that put up posters for us, some uh, organizations that helped share on, on social media, um, and, and that's where our promotion plan came from. So we developed that. Uh, so several weeks out, we, we, we put out the first post and then every week we put out a new post that was maybe talking about the route, talking about the decorations and maybe some examples of bikes that you could, you could try to copy um, as well as some of the, the vendors that were participating. So just to keep it sort of consistent and repetitive so that people are, um, you know, hearing about it, um, every week until the event. Um, and then also organizing volunteers and marshals. And I'll, I'll, I'll stress the importance of that uh, in a couple of slides, but um, just having people to help uh, guide the ride as well as be there for check-in, um, to answer questions, um, just having a, a, a solid team for the event is, is really important. And so that was sort of the, the process and the steps that we, that we took to, to put it all together. Anything to add uh, there, Mike? Uh, just one quick thing. Um, I think the location of the start of the ride was really important. I think we really chose well there. You know, a large park with lots of space for people to gather and, and not feel like they're stuck on the road somewhere because, again, you know, we could have got away with a smaller location be, be, um, if we had a smaller crowd. But when, once it's getting that big, um, there's no way we could have kept everybody contained. So it just made for a much more relaxed atmosphere as well. So the park in the center of the park was really, really a nice location for that. And you could just hear the chatter in the crowd too, the excitement building up too. So it was quiet. There was no traffic going by. So mm -hmm. I think that's really a key point too. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And, and we did, you know, have to tweak this, this route a couple of times, just to, we, we wrote it a few times and we wanted to make sure it was the right length and that, you know, there weren't too many uh, crossings um, that were uh, potentially hazardous. So again, I'll touch more on that sort of on the lessons learned uh, slide. Here's just some other events that we put together. And I know that, uh, you know, you probably want to hear more about the bike the night, but I think there's also some, some great examples of other events that we put together that uh, sort of have taught us, uh, again, how to put on a successful biking event. Um, just recently, we had the Guelph Fall Colors bike ride, which brought out, I think it was about 60, 60 people, Mike? Yep. Yeah, yep. Yep. Um, which was quite successful. We had to actually postpone it because of rain, but um, the day that we did it was, was perfect. It was a little bit chilly, but um, you know, people got on their bikes and we enjoyed some of the some of the fall colors and um you know it took us through uh one of the old uh, neighborhoods in guelph and then through the university and um and there was two uh, two uh routes as well so a shorter route and a longer route so i we felt that that was important to uh give options for riders um and then earlier this summer we also had a, a meetup 
uh, in August that was downtown, just again, just a show of force or demonstrating that cyclists use the city. Um, we're here and, um, you know, be aware of us as well as the love your bike event, which is an annual event that, uh, GCAT hosts, uh, in partnership with a, a few partners, um, again, just to, uh, to, to bring people out to talk about bikes and to, um, to cycle in the community. So that's, uh, you know, the events that we held this year, in addition to bike the night. Um, so yeah, I want to jump into some of the things that we've learned and, and, uh, and again, some of the things that, that, that Barry can consider if, if you're looking to host your own event or bike the night. Um, so partners and sponsors. Yeah. Really important that we in, in, engage bike shops and local breweries to provide, provide the pi prize packs, um, and to bring in and work with organizations and community groups who share the same goals and vision for the event. Um, and, and even if, if this is just to spread the word on social media or volunteering or, or sponsoring the event, um, that was really important to sort of have that, uh, those connections. Um, the importance of the pre-ride meetup event was, was definitely something that we, we learned um, to have a, a plan for, say, like registration as well at the pre-ride event and check-in and, and collecting rider information there. Um, to have a booth for, for, for people to check in. Um, the info that we, we do collect, um, I'll just mention uh, at, at our events is you know, a way to try to promote membership, but it's also um, to collect postal codes so that we, we can identify where people are coming from in order to prioritize uh, future events or even particular infrastructure projects that we want to advocate for. So, so just knowing where people are coming from um, typically we host our events near and around downtown, but there's infrastructure that's in the South of Guelph as well. And maybe we should be putting some events there or putting some of our advocacy uh, efforts towards the South end as well. So that's good to know. Um, as well as the pre-ride event, having some kind of giveaway was really important. So for bike the night, we provided uh, again, reusable LEDs and glow sticks and, and reflective tape. Um, and for the fall colors ride, we handed out bike maps and some stickers and as well, um, it's, it's the 318 project, right, Mike? Oh, uh, 929, I think they, um, you're talking about the, um, mm -hmm. the bike. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think it's 929, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a registration where you can register yeah. your bike. Yeah. So if it, if it goes missing or gets stolen, then you can register mm -hmm. it online. So just some sort of, you know thing that you can give to, 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 uh, to attendees. Um, I think as well for the pre-ride meetup event, you know, the importance of having entertainment or some kind of pre-ride social, um, for bike the night, we had the music and the ice cream and the contest and, um, and some sort of announcement well, as well to sort of promote our organization and what we do. Um, there was also the, we noticed the, you know, the, the importance of, of route planning and, and the role of marshals. And I said, I'd touch on this and this is really important, of course. So choosing a route that's safe and interesting and uh, fit for, for all levels. Um, so for bike the night, we you know, wanted to use all sorts of active transportation facilities, the safest crossings. So we actually, um, I spent some time on Google Maps Street View to sort of identify where some of the crossings would be that we would need one uh, volunteer to, to hit the, um, the crossing button while others were able to cross safely. So even going down to that sort of level of, of, of detail to just make sure that at every possible place um, on the route there, that there was a plan um, for safe crossings. Um, we also wanted to ensure that there was interesting scenery as well. So for the fall colors ride, that was important, but also for bike the night. So in integrating the, the covered bridge with the lights on it, I think that was important as well. Um, the next point I think is also important um, and you can approach this in, in, in many different ways, but uh, considering how you're gonna navigate the route and other road users. So, um, you know, you have the option of having a completely closed off course um, for the, the hub in, in Vancouver. What they do is they, they engage with the, the local police force and, and have the, the route completely closed off to, to all other road users. Um, 
But then there's the you know other side of the spectrum where it's a critical mass ride, where it's a lot more grassroots, where you're just taking up space on the road. Um, and you're sort of being visually impactful. And I think there's a place for that as well. Uh, we opted for somewhere in the middle. Um, we didn't want to engage the police to close off the streets, um, but we also wanted riders to obey the Highway Safety Act and, and traffic laws. So what we did was we led it ourselves as a group, but we ensured that people were, um, you know, stopping and, 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 and being safe and, and respecting other road users. And in some cases, there you know were there were cars that just let us go through the intersection. They they saw us and they and they thought, wow, what a what an interesting spectacle. So they you know I, I think that's important to consider. Um, I feel like there's pros and cons to each uh, option, but it that's certainly important to to consider if you're putting on this type of event. Um, as well, having a plan for if the group splits up. So it happens a couple of times in in bike the night as well as the fall colors ride. Um, due to just the lights, the traffic lights, and also pacing. Um, so what we didn't do in Bike the Night, but what we did in Fall Colors was to have a regroup zone every like three to four kilometers so that people could stop and wait for the rest of the group to catch up so that we are more of a cohesive group and people could you know mingle a little bit more on the ride. Um, which brings me to the next point is having a marshal a Marshall plan. Um, so if, uh, there's someone at the front, someone in the back and some, someone in the middle or a few, um, just to make sure that people are crossing safely, have someone with, uh, a, a first aid kit. Um, if they have any questions or concerns, they, they know who to turn to as well as having them be identifiable. So whether it be through a flag or, uh, like a high vis vest, of course, that was a little bit more challenging at bike the night because everyone was wearing high vis. Um, and, and also to, to create a, a document for, for marshals. Um, again, we called it the Marshall plan, which was kind of, kind of funny. Um, uh, so to communicate the roles and the responsibilities, the safety guidelines, and again, the specific areas of the route where there, there might be some, some safety, uh, concerns. So by, at crossings and whatnot, um, Promotion in all forms, um, like Mike mentioned, uh, the, the, the poster was, you know, the thing that we shared across social media, and we also had um, post, a poster campaign, so uh, passing it out to, to cafes and restaurants to put up, I think that was super important. We also engaged local media, so Guelph Today did a, did a story and promoted us um, and the Bike the Night event as well as connecting with local dignitaries. So we, again, we had the mayor, we had uh, Mike Schreiner, our local MPP. Um, and actually this was just before the federal election. So we had a number of uh, candidates out as well. Um, so yeah, promotion again, uh, consistently and it is important. Um, and then, you know, the element of fun, uh, just having a contest and having some kind of way to encourage people to have a little friendly competition. Um, having music playing throughout the event is also important. So uh, bringing speakers on the ride itself. And like I said, we, I had one speaker strapped to my bike, but if we had known we, you know, we're going to have the amount of people that we did, we probably would have had more speakers and maybe some volunteers using them on their bikes uh, to have that sort of, you know, uh, that music playing throughout the, uh, throughout the group. Um, and, and creating some sort of funky playlist. Again, we started ours off with Queen and I thought everyone had a, had a blast with that one. Um, I think the importance as well at capturing the experience through photos and videos to, and encouraging riders to do the same um, safely. Um, and we planned a few stops along the route to take group photos. So at the cover bridge, we did a group photo. Uh, at the beginning of the ride, we did a group photo. And at the end of the ride, we did a group photo. So just to have people share it uh, across their own channels and platforms, just to, to bring up engagement um, was super important. Um, and then lastly, tying the ride to other community events or projects. Again, with the covered bridge, that was something that the city of Guelph was already doing. Um, was that lit up bridge project. And as well, we knew that the patios were going to be busy because of the patio program. So uh, in incorporating that into the ride as well. Um, so yeah, I, 
I've, I've uh, talked a lot. Mike, do you have anything to add there? No, I'm just uh, thinking about time here again. Um, I'll just add one quick thing. I, I think inviting the local dignitaries uh, worked out really well because they're masters of uh, social media themselves. So after the event, for instance, our mayor sent out this brilliant video of, of, uh, of the ride itself, and it, it got unbelievable you know, following. And, and I think the same with, with uh, Mike Schreiner. So mm-hmm. it's important. I mean, we invite them because we should, probably should, but also both of them are real champions for active transportation. So that was part of it as well. So yeah, I think we should move on a little bit, Mike, I think. Oh yeah, well, we're at the end there, Mike. So uh, yeah, so all in all, those were sort of the the main sort of successes and and lessons that we learned and and hope that maybe you can take these and you don't have to reinvent the wheel and and, and, uh, copy it and and do something similar in Barrie. So yeah, thanks for inviting us again. And uh, if you have any questions, we're we're happy to answer, but um, I'm sure if you have any questions and you want to email us, you can do that as well. So thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, very inspiring stuff. It's uh, that video was awesome. Like I can't believe how many people, the the vibe that that ride must have been amazing. Um, so you have a few minutes to stick around for a couple questions. Of course. Sure. Yeah. That's okay. Okay. So uh, any committee members have some questions about the ride or about their organization? Anything, Emory? Thanks, Mike. I've got pages of notes. I think I've actually um, crafted a, a quasi presentation back to the committee about how we make this happen. But some things came to mind and without getting in there, you know, kind of three things um, when I'm thinking about um, what this could look like for for Barry. One, you know, I, I know there are individuals who love to bike as well as walk their dog. And so were there pieces there where you had to manage kind of what was in and out of scope for safety around individuals that tend to bike while having a dog on the leash? Because I, I do see that as part of how they um, might want to prefer to to participate. Yeah, well, we, we didn't we didn't encounter that situation. Um, I, I, to my knowledge, no one asked us about uh, bringing their pets along. I mean, people brought their children along, um, but they had them either in uh, buggies or strollers or, uh, you know, on their own bikes. Um, but we didn't have anyone bringing their pets, I think. Um, no, we, we actually did, Mike. We had one guy bring his pet in his in a- in his trailer yeah oh okay i didn't I, sorry i didn't i didn't see that yeah, um but certainly i don't think we'd want somebody no i think like because because, because we were on the roads quite a bit yeah. like um i think it's advisable to not bring pets on leashes especially because of the pacing as well um and just because we're clustered as a as a riding group so i think promoting it as predominantly a cycling event we did because we're GCAT, you know, active transportation is in our name. We know that walking and other modes of active transportation are important too, but um, promoting this as mostly a biking event, I think is important just logistically, right? Yeah, no, that's good. And I was wondering too about, you know, I'm thinking about where our infrastructure and our past conversations have gone around, you know, Firebird Community Cycle and that being an amazing um, uh, organization that we have in Barrie that does an upcycling of uh, of bike parts and sales and also um, um, big promoters also around where we might be able to put some infrastructure in our community centers, I think was one conversation around bike repair stands. Mm-hmm. And so I also think a bit about how do we create destinations that also allow for education and, and maybe theming something around June with bike month, but also then September back to school and those reminders about uh, kids on bikes and safety and tying in a lot of different community conversations. But also doing some demonstrations around where are bike racks and where are bike repair stands and how do you use them? So mm. you don't have bikes sitting in, you know, garages through the year and you're choosing different uh, modes of transportation. Yeah. So I have a lot of different um, pieces around that, but it made me think a bit about, is there a role for cities and municipalities to kind of link active transportation rides it's to programming in recreation. So I know we talk about different um, reasons for active transportation, some that are around like uh, getting from point A to B and actually adopting that as your mode of transport versus the recreation side of, of you know, cycling. And I'm wondering if there's 
an evolution of where you've taken the bike the, the night. And I'm thinking about, you know, programming in general about how people can join a, a bike club. And I know we have the cycling group, but around where can families and kids go to socialize more about biking to an area, having a, a guided bike and feeling maybe more comfortable about going out on their own. Um, and is that a place where we could be more creative or consider what that could look like around going to your um, city facilities and community centers to meet up and whether or not there might be a, an expanded role uh, on programming. Mike, do you have any thoughts on, on that question? <laughs> I was gonna hope you answer that one. Um, <laughs> I, Valid, I don't know, yeah. on, on, the, on that particular ride, I don't know how we could uh, promote other, those other things you're talking about, but certainly on our other events we've used that, that um, for instance, a Love Your Bike uh, event we had, we had a storytelling um, section in that where people who'd say, for instance, purchased a cargo bike and they were, you know, they'd actually eliminated their car. And so they told a story of how their lifestyle had changed with this uh, purchase of the, of the some, in some cases, it was an e-powered uh, cargo bike. And we, we just heard some great stories. And that get, inspires people to, you know, to, to maybe think about that sort of thing. You know, um, um, that's just one example. You know, we, I don't know, I can't think of anything right off the top of my head to expand on that. But uh, we, for instance, we also have just talking about the, um, bike repair stations. We have some great supporters like the Woolly Pub in Guelph. Um, they've got a bike repair station and we're seeing a few more of them popping up now too. So um, yeah, that's about all I can say on that right now. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, the, the events like Bike the Night in Fall Colors was an opportunity for us to, to, to talk about some of the you know, available programming and infrastructure that exists. Right. So uh, you have an audience, use it um, and, and, and tell them, Hey, I mean, you can cycle all year round. You don't have to wait for these types of events. You can, you know, uh, access that kind of programming and uh, infrastructure. Um, so maybe if it's handing out a map or some sort of brochure or guide that sort of educates people on, on cycling in the city um, at those events, I think that's a good connection as well. I have to also be a little careful of when, for instance, bike the night, you know, people are all anxious to get going. They don't run, want to hear long speeches about all sorts of infrastructure and things like that. You don't want to spoil the event. You want to make sure you tell them that, you know, we're available for it and join, join us and sign up for a newsletter because there's ton, tons of information in that too. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of a fine line about making it fun and then getting into a long drawn out speech, you know, and kind of spoiling the atmosphere of the, of the event. Good point, Mike. Yeah. 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 Oh, brilliant. I got so many places where this could go. Less questions for you, more around, hopefully we can bring you back to Barry and join in one of our bike events. Of course. So thanks, uh, Anne-Marie, for those questions. Uh, I have John up next, and then Kelly, and then Sherry. Great. Thanks, and yeah, thanks again. Uh, for the two mics for coming, doing the presentation. What, a, what an amazing uh, event you guys put together there. I had many questions, but um, one of them was um, September. You guys picked September. How did you land on that? Days it like shorter days, like earlier in the night, or was that... Was that why you picked September rather than maybe August or July? Yeah, that, that was, that was one of the factors was, uh, yeah, the sun sets a little earlier. So it was about, uh, I think it was seven twenty five was when sunset, uh, started, but then the sort of, we had to wait until, um, what is it called? Nautical, uh, evening. It's like, it's, it's, it's where the sun has set below the, a, uh, below the horizon enough degrees where there is still some ambient light, um, but it's not pitch black. So we had to hit that. Like, so we looked online, we did some research, like what is the optimal time to start this event based on the day and where the sun is going to be? Uh, Cause we wanted for people to still be able to gather during the daytime, have the pre-ride event. And then once we get started, it's, it's dark out. So uh, I think having the shorter days was important. Um, and also the fact that school uh, was back. So the university students were back. Um, so hopefully drawing some, some attendees from that. Cool. And then did you guys have a contingency plan for weather? Or we just plan just to go through it no matter what, if, if it was raining or. Um, did, did we have a rain, <laughs> rain date, Mike? I, I, 
I don't think we did for that one, but we did. No. For, we had for our next event, um, which we had to actually use. We did have a rain date for the next one, but mm-hmm. that no, we were we were basically going with it, and it just miraculously worked out. So <laughs> yeah, we lucked out for sure. <laughs> it's important to get good weather for all these events, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's great. One thing we can't control. One, one more question, uh, if you don't mind. Um, so you guys picked a different starting and ending location. If you're doing it again, would you do the same thing or, or would you start with the same location and loop back to the same location with, with multiple loops? I was, I was only thinking of it because of if you had um, two loops, you could do a longer loop and a shorter loop or if, you, if it's better to keep them all together. wasn't sure if you guys thought about that or how you felt it worked with, with the start and end different spots. Yeah, well, we went back and forth on this, actually. We, we, we originally, I think, wanted it to end in the same location, but we realized that um, the way back, there wasn't as many roads that we wanted to take a big group of people on, So, uh, and we didn't want to just follow the same route back. Um, um, and as well, we wanted to definitely tie in ending or, or at least passing through downtown because of the patio program. Um, yeah, so we, we landed on that, just ending it in a different location. I, I feel like it, it's really dependent on, on your own geography, right? So I feel like you have massive amount of green space at the lakefront, right? So it, it, I'm, I'm sure the city of Barrie, you could start it and end it at the same location. But for us, it was just, I think, just a better route um, to, to end it in a different location. There were some people that, that had to drive in. So they, they parked at the, at, at the park, sorry, they parked at the park, but, um, and so they had to navigate back on their own. Um, we might reconsider the route next year, but um, that was kind of the thinking that went into it. Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> well, they're all good points there, Mike, exactly how we went through the planning of that. Um, one of them was actually so that we could actually end up downtown and then actually after the event support the local merchants who've had so much trouble through COVID was a big part of it as well. Um, we, we could actually have done a loop. We have a great trail system in Guelph too. So we could have done a loopy kind of thing too. For instance, our last ride ended up at a brewery, which is one of our supporters. It started and ended at the same location basically. Um, so yeah, it would, like Mike was saying, it would depend on your geography and Barry to, to plan it out properly. And you could also do a, a different one. It doesn't have to be just one ride in a year. It, I think this thing could be pretty popular. You might actually get away with two of them, uh, quite easily. Um, yeah. Yeah. I know there's a, you know, more, uh, gorilla style ad hoc, uh, critical mass rides that happen like every month in some, in some cities. Yeah. So I'll let other members questions too, but, but thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, Kelly, go ahead. And then Sherry, after. I just want to say a thank you to you both for attending and sharing your very passionate and detailed um, support of active transportation uh, on the planet, and especially in Guelph. Um, it, I'm, I'm amazed at all the different, uh, activities that, uh, and jealous <laughs> of all the different events and activities that, that, uh, you guys, uh, volunteer and put together. I'm, I'm just like, wow. Um, and you know, all to, to understand and get people uh, thinking about, uh, riding their bike, you know, to the grocery store instead of taking their car, <laughs> um, you know, getting, getting people uh, out there and families. And, and this is an amazing event. And I know we've kind of struck a subcommittee, Sherry and John, um, you know, about education and, and, and events. So I'm really hoping we can um, put something together, uh, you know, soon um, so we can start to, uh, to emulate um, what uh, you you guys have put so um, amazingly together, um, so I just I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much, and and I really appreciate your passion and uh, and your um, ingenuity. <laughs> so thank you. I don't really have a question. I just want to say thanks. <laughs> thanks, Kelly. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right, go ahead, Sherry. <clears throat> Yes, thank you, um, Mike and Mike. Uh, fabulous event. Um, congratulations on your success. 
Um, I have a million questions, but in, in the interest of time, I guess my main question is basically, um, one of your goals was uh, to uh, increase comfort on the road. Um, and you had a variety of users with skills and abilities. And I'm wondering, um, I didn't hear any kind of evaluation in your um, planning sort of approach and wondered if you had collected any sort of anecdotal information about whether or not you had achieved that goal or whether or not people would be on that type of celebratory event consider uh, cycling for their day to day. Like I, I'm curious to know if there were any of those types of outcomes that the uh, event led to that type of mindset change or interest or behavior change. Hmm. Yeah, we didn't have any sort of formal uh, reporting. I think that's, again, a uh, lesson that we learned was uh, maybe collecting some of those, that, 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 uh, that evidence, the uh, anecdotes. Uh, I, th I think we heard on the ride and after the ride, just some, some comments with, with riders uh, who, who are really happy about it and, uh, you know, love, loved the event. Uh, so, I mean, um, on that end, yeah, it was successful. But in terms of uh, intentions to cycle uh, outside of the event, I don't know. Mike, did you he hear anything about, about that? No, I didn't, Mike. But I know we had a follow up meeting, uh, Sherry, just on on our you know our success with the ride and and you know what worked and what didn't work. And and we did actually talk about trying to to figure out you know maybe sending out a survey to the people who came on the ride. Um, to ask their, you know, to get their input, you know, on, on infrastructure in Guelph. So um, it's certainly a thought for next one. Again, we didn't dream that would that many people would show up, but um, mm -hmm. it's an opportunity to, at that point when you get that many people showing up to get, you know, a good picture of what people want as far as bike infrastructure. Yeah. And, and I, yeah, I think as well, like um, it's, it's not too late. I mean, certainly it's probably better to send out feedback surveys immediately after the event, but I think what we might do is, is do sort of an annual membership survey. Like, so if, if you have attended any of our events, which ones, and what were some of the takeaways for you from those events? Do you feel safer, more knowledgeable um, on, on city uh, cycling infrastructure? So we, we can certainly still ask those questions. Um, it just won't be specific to the event. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's great to learn it when you have that critical mass of people and their attention, like if you'd want this to be part of your more your day to day or part of your routine in some way, what would you need to have see different or have done or changes made to help you make that choice. Uh, because I think people have a lot of fun at those events, but I think ultimately we'd like to see them doing that more than just at the event, right? So how do you how do you engage in getting that feedback about what they need to make that happen? So yeah, anyway, thank you very, very much. It was a great presentation. I loved hearing about it. Thanks, Sherry. Thanks, Sherry. And just one quick follow-up to that. Um, we actually did get a uh, grant from the city recently, which we're working on to create safe bike routes to schools. Um, and you guys might be interested. We could share this with you as a later date. So we have a... Um, you know, we, we work with the University of Guelph and then we have a PhD student working in the geography department. So we're probably going to hire her to do this. And it'll be, you know, it'll be kind of a mapping project, right? So it will actually um, work with a lot of inputs into this mapping project and you'll be able to customize it yourself actually in some ways. We'll also be getting a GoPro camera to actually, actually, you know, so we'll actually ride some of these routes and show people safe ways of getting around the city. There's a, even in our city, you know, it's not that big. For instance, I'm not even familiar with a lot of our trail systems in the South End. Um, they're not, they're poorly, um, you know, um, there's, not, there's not much signage for instance. So I can actually make it from downtown Guelph to one of our, you know, oldest malls for instance, and by, by a, a trail mostly. And most people would never know how to get there by a trail, they just, just would take a car, right? But we actually took our MPP just the other day, actually, in a bike ride there, showed him an underpass underneath our Hanlon Expressway. He had no idea it was there. You know, um, little things like that, you know, um, can make an amazing difference to get more people out riding if they know there's a safe way to get there. Yeah. Oh, and I took our mayor out actually a short time ago, too. Same <laughs> He wasn't even familiar with some of our trails, you know, he just bought a new e-bike. So now he's actually like, I mean, we think e-bikes are going to be the, you know, the game changer. We took he, he and his wife out on, uh, on a ride as well to show him some of the, the connection problems we have when you get to busy streets that haven't been fixed yet in Guelph. And there's a lot of them. I mean, we have lots of great trails, but when you reach the road, 
that's where people really worry about crossing with their kids and that's why they won't ride. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, trust me, we can relate here in Barry. Uh, yeah, Anne-Marie, did you have a question? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say on that, President Mike, I just realized you're the president of the GCAT. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, so congratulations I'm yeah. on that. Yeah, cheers. Um, but on that too, I keep thinking a bit about, you know, when we talk a bit about active transportation and accessibility, how we, when we do the outreach around activating people to safely take their bike and explore this, how do we also not miss an opportunity to get their feedback around, what did you like about the ride? Um, you know, will you come back again on your own? Do you feel comfortable enough around your confidence to kind of, to do this again or to bring others with you? Or what about that route? Um, are pieces of feedback we need to be filtering into the city um, to say, you know, these are the areas that um, are, you know, impactful about people's choices around adopting the route or not. And mm-hmm. so I keep looking at that as a lens to say, how do we help people actually be part of that feedback loop and some of these guided routes, if we can be very deliberate with them um, around pausing to talk a bit about the feedback and actually um, serving that back to the accessibility committee and or to the transit services. I'd love for us even to take our bikes on the bus, right? And show people yeah. if, you're, if you're not kind of on the a downtown connected core around routes or you're hesitating about like how long it's going to take you and you don't have an e-bike because um, we're even having those conversations around hills and physical abilities around bikes or needing different types of bikes from uh, getting onto one and, and you know, um, and, and off, but showing people how to use our transit system around using their bike uh, and using the bus for part of um, a pathway. Yeah, all great points, exactly, yeah. It's difficult sometimes just getting people to do that little tiny step though, of writing a letter to their counselor or, or you know, the transportation department, just to say that, even in like take two minutes to do it. You know, I think they just, it's like anything else, getting people to vote, getting people to do all sorts of things. It's really difficult. So wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be beautiful we, if we had all 10 counselors next spring um, do a, a bike with residents on a particular route and they got feedback and were part of that process and we think about you know expanding the conversation from just this committee mm-hmm. and those that might be more active in the conversation to a 360 of how do people bike within their wards and then lead that up to maybe an event downtown and even put our pump track that we just invested in on city hall and the skating rink before the ice is in and so those that are using scooters and other modes can actually show a demo and and then see that concentration coming into city hall around connected routes and how do we look at navigating out of the downtown Mm -hmm. yeah i think i think you brought up a good point about uh, you know leading those group rides as as a committee or or in our case as as an organization and and then filtering the feedback from from the ride to city council um, or to the staff in the planning department. So, so almost using, you know, our events, um, as, as a vehicle for, for that feedback. Um, so we, we don't currently have a sort of a templated feedback survey, but it's certainly something that we, we probably will be putting together for future events and say, Oh, how'd you like the ride? Uh, what sort of areas in the route were you most you know, concerned about? And then using that to then submit comments to, to city staff. So, um, yeah, we don't have that and feedback we, survey yet, but if you have a template you're willing to send to us and uh, <laughs> we, we'd happily learn from that. That'd be great. I'd love to explore that. And I'm also thinking though, how, how do we think of better our Barry library as a stakeholder? So mm-hmm. you can go to your library here in Barry and you could for free add, uh, lend out fishing poles and fishing tackle and use the waterfront. You can go and actually sign out musical um, uh, instruments should we have a sign out for bikes? Like where does your library also become part of that hub of active transportation? We actually did try to get the library involved with a, um, like a bike share program at one point, but it became a bit of a bureaucratic nightmare, to be honest with you. Um, you know, library as with any, you know, um, city organization, but, um, but yeah, the library has in Guelph, it's, a, it's very similar sounding to yours. Actually, they have a lot of different programs for loaning out things and um, libraries are changing. Yeah, for sure. But the, the tool library too, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We have a great, this 
you can expand a bit on the tool library, Mike, but we also, uh, we've also held um, all candidates bike rides too um, in the past, which was a great way of getting, especially during election year, getting them all out there because they want to get the biggest audience they can get, right? So we also have a ride like that and it brings out a lot of people and gives them a chance to talk to their MP or their, or their counselor or whoever it is at the time that we're doing it. But um, yeah, all sorts of things you can do. I love all these ideas. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a, a cycling all candidates debate where they're cycling and debating at the same time. I'd like to see <laughs> candidates try. Uh, okay, so um, thank you so much to Mike and Mike for uh, being here today. Lots for us to take away and think about uh, and incorporate into uh, some initiatives that we'll take on. Um, I think as a committee, uh, Kelly mentioned the, the subcommittee on education and events, uh, and maybe that's uh, a forum where we can really have these conversations. And um, so if uh, there are committee members who would like to be involved, Kelly, is that okay if we uh, sort of use that subcommittee oh, yeah. as the venue? That, that, to... was, that was kind of the intention. So anybody else that I know um, John um, uh, Sherry said, you know, when she can, and and you know she's definitely interested. And Anne Marie's now put her hand up. So um, anybody else, please. Yeah, I, I think uh, this is something that um, you know, given this, it, it's almost been a, like a gift of of this presentation, especially with all the detail, <laughs> because it's very detailed, Mike. <laughs> um, and that we could, you know, adopt it and um, you know run with something um, potentially in the spring. Um, I see this, you know, as one of the one of the pieces. But but also thinking about um, Brett as well and the consultants that are currently um, working on the active transportation piece. I also know there's one or two of those I recall that have been assigned to uh, education and um, support. So um, perhaps that's something uh, they could also lend a hand on, I'm not sure. But um, I think this, this can be a collaborative uh, of, um, uh, piece that uh, we can work together with the existing consultants as well as the committee and um, whoever else uh, would like to become a part of this because I, I think it can be far reaching, including Tourism Barry, the BIA. Um, it, it, there's a lot of uh, potential collaborations here. Yeah, absolutely. So, yes. um, I, I want to give uh, an opportunity for our, our guests to head out if, if they need to. You've been so generous with your time. You're also welcome to stay to the end of the meeting if you want to just uh, watch, but uh, no hard feelings if you need to leave as well. That's okay. Uh, I'll have to sign off. But uh, yeah, if um, if you'd like a copy of the slides, I'm happy to send that along. Um, that'd be as well, uh, I guess you have my email and Mike's email as well if you have any further questions. Um, or you can just email the, do we have an info at gcat.ca, Mike? Yep, we do. Yep. Okay. So that's Perfect. that's there as well. So if you have any follow-up questions, uh, don't hesitate. That's great. Thanks again. Okay. All right. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. 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 Thanks a lot. Even okay. I was just wondering. Yeah. Um, a thought came, although we've lost uh, them, and I didn't want to hold them up. But to Kelly and that small group that gets together, I'm also wondering, big picture. And I see Mike's there. I'm not sure if Guelph is a bike friendly city. I know we've been trying to get that certification, and if this strategically, when we look at what this could look like, if it could tie into positioning as well for the next time we apply to be uh, considered as a bike friendly city. Yeah, Mike, Mike, are you guys a bike friendly city? Do you know? Um, can you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. good. Uh, we actually are. I can't remember if it was a certain level in bike friendly, but yeah, we are actually. Yeah. Okay. We have little stickers that actually you can stick on your bike showing that sort of thing too. Yeah. The city promotes it. Yeah. yeah. Definitely yeah. Worth getting. Yeah. Yeah. Well done, Mike. Yeah. Hey, thanks a lot. I really should go now though. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Take care. Um, okay. So um, I guess if, um, if there are more committee members interested in getting involved in this work, uh, reach out to Kelly. Yes. Is that okay? Okay. Perfect. And uh, we'll get started. I think uh there's so much opportunity here. Um, any other discussion or questions on this or thoughts before we move on? Anne-Marie? 
Thank you, Kelly, for taking the initiative and doing the outreach. I think that was, I mean, this is going to move us to a very valuable place. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you for taking that initiative. Yes, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it. So happy to have you on the committee. Um, actually, uh, I just thought of it. We have two vacancies on this committee, and I wanted to bring this up today uh, before I forget. Um, so two vacancies. If you know anyone who's interested in applying, please encourage them to apply through the city's website. Um, we could use a, a couple more uh, people around the table, and uh, they could help out with the... Uh, this event we'll be creating too. So um, the link is on the city's website. Uh, Sherry, did you have a question or thought on that? Yeah, just with respect to the uh, vacant uh, membership, um, I'm wondering, are we able, if we haven't been successful in recruiting a couple of members for this latest round, can we go back to previous applicants who were strong candidates that maybe weren't selected in the past? Because I know I have heard from folks who identified their interests but weren't selected before. And so I'm just wondering if that maybe can be a contingency sort of plan, but yeah. Definitely, I'll, I'll reach out to, to the clerk about that and uh, make sure that they are notified that there's, there's two vacancies. Um, I see Maria's hand and then Andy. Thanks, Ellen. Um, I just had some questions and comments about the first presentation. So are we moving past that? Or I we're, just, we're, we're gonna, should I just type them and send them in? Or we're gonna what, get I just to wanted to make sure, sure I wasn't uh, losing that uh, opportunity. And it's just a couple of things. Uh, just take a minute. To, so thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's next. Uh, we're going to go back to that right after okay. this. Um, Andy? Just going to mention that I'll uh, reach out to Firebird because uh, I'm part of that one too. And uh, I know that uh, Grant was thinking about joining the committee because uh, I think Firebird would be key, especially at the very least, I'll say, yeah, and there's a couple of positions available. There's also this initiative that and a new event. And then I'll put you in connection with Kelly on that because I think Firebird will be a key partner to get that initiative going. Uh, I know that Grant wasn't able to do it because he uh, was a baby was impending, but now the baby's here, so I'm sure it's tons of time. So, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, okay, um, okay. So I think we're we're clear on uh, next steps there, um, and uh, yeah, tell your friends about the vacancy. Okay, so let's get back to the Bradford Street uh, EA item. Um, so we had that presentation and Brandy has sent through the presentation slides uh, to all the committee members through email, um, if you want to reference those. Um, so uh, Maria, I know you had some thoughts. So if you want to start us off, go ahead. Sure. Thanks so much. And these are more just considerations, not necessarily a need for discussion, uh, mostly for Brett to just to uh, just put it on his uh, radar. Um, I just wondered about the impact for snow cleaning is uh, snow plowing. Are these lanes expected to be year round? Um, and if so, we from a practicality, I, I work for the government, I tend to have a very practical lens, uh, we need to design them in such a way that it's easy for the existing uh, equipment people, however, the shops run, uh, can do it and not end up creating a situation where people are having to go and hand shovel these things if they are a sort of 24-7, 365 um, program that's being offered. So I just want to throw that comment out there. Um, I This was more of a query around e-scooters and cargo bikes. Um, are, are we sort of imagining all of these vehicles on these um, these these lanes, because if so, multi-use path, I don't know, would be very appropriate uh, for e-scooters and stuff. And you have pedestrians, they, they can go quite quickly. I have an e-bike and those things get up to like 40 kilometers. Not that I'm suggesting anybody should be traveling at that speed, but it will happen. Um, the all season piece I had asked, and um, I just had an idea, slightly random, but uh, QR codes. So if we are looking for some feedback uh, on the TMP and maybe people aren't driving to the website and getting some of that feedback, um, maybe at the end of a route or at the beginning of a trail, we put the QR code, slap it right up there on the on the pole, on the light standard, wherever, and say, hey, how did you find this thing? Most people have um, you know, their devices on them. They can do a quick scan, three questions, boom, boom, boom. Room, and we can get the feedback from there. So, so lots of sort of not necessarily related <laughs> comments there, but uh, just thrown out for consideration and discussion. Thanks, Ellen. That's fantastic. Thank you. 
Uh, I see Eric's hand is up. If you want to take it away. Yes. And then <laughs> Thank you, Keenan. Um, just a, a question. It may be bigger than this whole plan. I'm not sure, but it does involve the Brad Street. Bradford Street corridor. I've thought of it in the, in the past. Is there any consideration either in the master plan that's already been addressing that or this, this current study on uh, maybe even seasonally diverting traffic off of Lakeshore through Bradford to get from South End Essa Road to downtown Barrie to uh, bring people to parking, overflow parking that allows them to walk to the beach and removes all the traffic along the narrow lanes on Lakeshore, north and south, um, where a lot of people in the, in, in the season are crossing the road with arms full of kids and, and beach toys. And a couple times I, I've just shuddered that someone's gonna get hurt along there. And the more traffic we could divert off of Lakeshore uh, along Bradford in peak season, summer, uh, would probably be beneficial. And this may be the kind of plan to tie that sort of thing because a, a lot of it could just be signage. I, I don't know. I'm over way oversimplifying it, but that's my thought. Yeah, that's something we're looking into a little bit. Um, there are challenges with uh, the desire of residents to endure additional delay uh, because of the views um, of what Lakeshore affords. Uh, we're seeing this where folks would rather um, spend time in the queue especially in the southbound direction versus uh, taking Bradford Street. We see that quite regularly. So there are challenges having or directing folks away from the street without imposing um, movement restrictions, which again would potentially cause issue with the recent investments the city's made in Lakeshore Drive itself. Um, but we are, are looking at that to see if there's any opportunity uh, for that without causing a significant impacts to uh, what was recently invested. Um, there's also a report back to council regarding a request for uh, lower speed limits as well on Lakeshore Drive as a related uh, item. Thank you, Brett. I'm glad to hear it's in consideration. Appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Brett. Sherry? I also appreciate the uh, a little bit more comprehensiveness with the lowered speed limits in addition to the considerations for the infrastructure. I think it needs to be very complementary and comprehensive in nature to shift people's travel behavior patterns. I'm all also always uh, cognizant and aware of, we want people, we, it can't just be that we're focused on um, facilities that support people who are skilled, you know, routine cyclists. I'm always concerned about families with children and we need the safest possible space, separated facilities for all users, because we're never going to accomplish getting those families out if we just have signed routes and lines, painted lines. Families are not comfortable with that. And given that the space that we're talking about, that corridor is very, is meant to be complementary to the lakeshore. I think we need to consider how do we, and we talked about, and, and Catherine, I think her name was talked about the transition points at the ends of that corridor, but also the connections between going from that uh, Bradford Street to the Lakeshore. And if we're trying to encourage people to come out and use that facility who would be going to the Lakeshore, i.e. families going to the park to play with their children, we need to have facilities that are separated and the most safe possible. Um, and also inviting. So the, the I, I think the cycle track that was closest uh, to the sidewalk with the buffer that separated them was seemed to be the most sort of appearance wise safe. Um, now, I don't know what all the things are in the new OTM uh, book 18 in terms of the best approach uh, for safety, but that did appear to be the, uh, a very uh, inviting space and the most safe, but also the idea of making it um, inviting and, and uh, with the planters and the greenery, that also gives drivers the sense that, you know what, there are you know, obstacles here and I need to slow down versus the removable bollards, for example, that still gives you the impression that it's hard infrastructure, it's meant for, you know, higher, it sort of gives me the sense it's still sort of, you know, a little bit faster space to travel through versus the planters, the greenery, the separated uh, uh, space. Um, and I think we just always need to be mindful of that. And I'm really advocating for 
making this available and inviting to families with children and vulnerable, other vulnerable users. So I think those are huge considerations from a safety and public health perspective. Absolutely, thank you, Sherry. And uh, interestingly enough, I had made the same note about the cycle track next to the sidewalk as it seemed like the best option from what was presented uh, in my mind. Uh, John and then Maria after. Thanks, Ken. Uh, this is kind of something I've brought up in the past too, but I hope, I know, I'm not sure if maybe the only options that we're looking at in there were related to bike lanes, locations, and sizes of the bike infrastructure and sidewalk infrastructure, um, if that's because we're the Active Transportation Committee, but I hope they're also considering options for narrower lanes and smaller boulevard. Uh, I mean, looking at an option for a 3.3 meter wide lane, um, certainly saves space. If that's an option, I just, I just, I like to see options for the, the vehicles also being being squished if we have to, if we're, you know, if space is always limited. So I hope those, those are considerations as well. So it, it, I know it showed, yeah, the boulevard with the same in everyone as well. So those two items, I think. Yeah, important point. And something that stood out to me from the presentation was that every proposal uh, had um, an extra lane being added, an extra vehicle lane being added to Bradford Street. It's currently four lanes and uh, they're proposing five. And it just seems strange to me that in the year 2021, we're proposing widening uh, Bradford Street by an entire lane um, when we know that'll make it less pedestrian and cyclist friendly. So um, yeah, I think that's some really good feedback and something that I, I would agree with for sure. Um, and I don't know if Brett, you have any thoughts on that or whether there are other options being considered um, in, in terms of lane width and number of lanes. Yeah, so what what W sorry, what SEMA is looking at right now is sort of the ultimate configuration in terms of uh, a planning solution. Um, one of the challenges we run into is just how Kempenfelt Bay dissects the city's transportation network. Um, traditionally, if this was a complete grid system, you wouldn't see traffic being directed to such a constrained area really between Innisfil Street and Lakeshore Drive. Normally you'd see that dispersed across multiple arterials if you could imagine Kempenfell Bay did not exist. So we do have a challenge moving traffic um, from north to south within the city. And that's the rationale behind that additional lane. So there's conflicting demands on Bradford Street we're definitely taking into consideration as far as there is a need to move people. Um, and that could occur through different modes. But another reality we're living is just the growth in population from 210,000, I believe the 2031 forecast to 298,000 for 2051. So it's, it's a massive jump in population. And even with the most optimistic projections of AT uptake and transit, there's still that need to accommodate that auto mode. So it's something we're definitely looking at, but again, just uh, going back to kind of the initial opening statements, a lot of this is long range planning. There's no immediate plan to implement that fifth lane. The road itself was reconstructed in 2003. Um, so we're not in a position fiscally to even contemplate uh, tearing that road up. Uh, what we might see though, is um, if enough development occurs on that corridor is a potential interim streetscape where we could keep the four lanes and look at incorporating some sort of AT and sidewalk infrastructure in a, in a constrained manner. So that's something we're also looking at as well. Um, and that would that wouldn't change the lane width. They're all already about that width right now. Um, but as far as the ultimate, it's it's important that we have a benchmark where we uh, can give development kind of a firm guidelines and where we need their buildings set so we can start to uh, protect that corridor for that future streetscape. And I will say to the committee, as part of this, the TMP update, we will be looking at all our cross section standards uh, on lane widths as well as incorporating the latest AT as well. So that's uh, that's gonna be happening over the next couple of years. So that's identified as well. Okay, thanks for that, Brett. Uh, Maria, and then Kelly, and then Eric. Um, just a brief comment uh, based on what Sherry was saying. If, if we want lifelong riders, then they need to feel safe when they're young. Their parents need to be, I wouldn't let my kids out on certain parts of the city, absolutely. And they're like 13, they're older. Um, so I think to, to convert into that lifelong thing, we really need to make it comfortable. Uh, it's like transit. You know, we want to keep the, the students on. So when they get the money and they can go buy a car, they won't, they'll stay on transit from there. I think it's that same mentality. So what's that larger goal that we're looking for and, and start to make sure the planning kind of lines up with that, even if it might take a generation or 10 years to to kind of see the fruition on that thanks 
absolutely. Uh, Kelly? Um, thank you. I, I'm, I'm just echoing uh, Sherry's comments again about um, painted lines not being infrastructure and how we separate um, importantly for families and, and others, um, older adults as well, me being one of them, um, to have access to safe uh, transportation modes. The other question I had, Brett, and, and I'm not a planner, and, and I'm wondering when we put projections in for growth for people um, over the next, we know that we're, we're scheduled for, for all this growth over the next 20 years, 10 to 20 years. Do you apply a metric um, when it comes to a vehicle per person or a vehicle per family? And do we consider the uh, changing that metric based on our ideas of getting people out of cars, or do we stick with the same metric when it comes to, we need to build X number of these many lanes, wide roads, because we're growing exponentially and everybody's gonna have a car. I don't, I don't know if you guys have that particular metric, but I'd be interested to find out. So, so just, yeah, two questions there, and just to address the previous question. So any new project that's going through the planning phase, which would then go into construction, um, that would involve capital construction. We're typically moving away from on-road infrastructure. So just so committee knows that. Now, that being said, uh, through the cycle bearing infrastructure program and through the current TMP, any location where it's reasonable to retrofit a corridor without capital works, we are still looking at on-road facilities. Um, that is uh, a fiscal constraint that we have to live with um, uh, staff to be able to deliver some sort of connected network. But that does not mean that is the ultimate state of that network. There's always the opportunity in the future to look at options where we can elevate that corridor to kind of a separated facility. So it's always important to keep that in mind. Um, the question on trips and how we do that. So we, we go by trips and we base it off the population and we can devise or infer the amount of trips based on that population. And then we also apply trip reductions based on what we think is going to be uptake by transit and by uh, cycling mode share. We'll be updating that as part of the next TMP. And that's where it happens kind of on our five-year basis when we undertake those updates and do those adjustments. We benchmark other municipalities. We also take into consideration our climate uh, and demographics of the city uh, to help guide those decisions. Um, we'll also be asking the consultant as part of this exercise whether we should be looking at a global factor or if we need more specific factors um, because it's always challenging to encourage a higher modal split in single family neighborhoods with young families that have uh, a dance, hockey, et cetera, versus our intensification corridors where we see probably more folks with less um, commitments that would their lives would facilitate AT and transit better. Um, so that's something we're going to look at it as well, because it's much more easy to kind of bring those folks into the fold uh, versus other folks that have many tight uh, time constrictive activities throughout the day. Um, like, of course, we want to encourage everyone, but we will be exploring that. And just the last thing on that, too, is with a lot of these developments, too, we are we are pulling back uh, the parking. So typically most units uh, in multi-res, mid to high rise at most. Typically it's at one or less uh, parking space per unit. Uh, we might entertain a little bit higher value if it's a multi-bedroom unit, uh, but again, very rarely you'd ever see a, a two unit allocation to, uh, to a residential unit in a mid or high rise development on those intensification corridors or in the urban growth centers. So those adjustments are being made. Okay, uh, I have Eric up next. I'm just looking at the clock here and we have two items, uh, quick items uh, that we need to talk about before the end of the meeting. So I'd like to wrap up this conversation if we can. And uh, we have time to uh, think about it a bit more. We have the slides and we can provide that feedback uh, through email or at our next meeting. Um, but Eric, if you if you have something now, you can go ahead. Thank you, Keenan. That's okay. I'll wait till the slides come and I'll make a few comments on email in, in the interest of time here. Thank you. Okay, I appreciate that, Eric. Um, okay, so um, the circular economy presentation that will be pushed off to next month. Uh, the staff member was not available for this month. Um, so Amory wanted to note something just uh, on the tree bylaw piece uh, because it was passed through council last night or general Thanks. committee. 
So two quick notes. One, I'm hoping we can put this on our agenda for December. In the meantime, I've sent everybody the staff memo that went to general committee last night. Um, it barely passed. Um, there's a, perhaps a conversation for us to have around how do we support some work that came out of our committee through city building to general committee, but might not um, live through a budget process. So please take the time to review the staff memo. Um, there's other resources I put there, and then perhaps you can send me questions or thoughts you have, but maybe we could land this on our December agenda. And then lastly, um, cause I'm sorry, I have to exit. Um, shout out to Living Green, Andy. Um, uh, we've partnered up for part of our beautification project. I'll let you add anything that you want to. Uh, sorry, I have to exit, but Friday at 3.30, we're meeting at Crompton. We're doing a tree planting. Um, we're adding some different species um, with, um, thank you to Kevin um, Rankin, um, different um, trees from the city as well as through Living Green to add some biodiversity um, aspects there that ties into the Crompton initiative. I can give more information about that in December as well. You're welcome to come. If you wanna see the space, plant a tree um, and or do some good PR for active transportation sustainability. Um, but thank you, uh, Andy. I know you've got that coordinated with volunteers and um, pleased to see that happening. Thanks, Emory. Andy, if you'd like to add anything, go ahead. Um, so I will say that uh, I've started a little bit of a pilot project with three different counselors, actually, that are starting for the next three days. I'll be out there planting. So uh, tomorrow I'm actually going to be at Victoria Woods Park with Barry Ward. And then the following day, Jim Harris uh, at, um, uh, along Innisfil, an area. And these are going to be smaller plantings. Both these two will be 20, 20 trees. And how we've done that one, just to put it out there, is... Uh, I directly invited the 20 households that were closest to the planting site. And the idea behind that is that uh, they were directly invited. I've got three families from each of the two plantings I just mentioned coming out. Uh, then hopefully they become the ones that look after the trees after. And that's really sort of the key part that I want to get to. It's not just about planting. It's about the next two years and what's going to happen there. So it's kind of a little bit of a pilot season for these. And then the third one, which uh, is a sort of a different beast is this one with Anne Marie at Crompton. So yes, she would like to extend the invitation to uh, anyone on this committee who'd like to join us as well. Um, we have about 12 volunteers that are coming out to help plant. Um, and the goal there will be to increase the biodiversity uh, because the scouts had gone out there a few years ago and planted a lot of white pine. So the white pine will be a wonderful forest of white pine, but we'd like to get some additional species in there. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me after, but uh, this is a great little uh, dipping our toe in the water into this idea and I have one more announcement that's related to it it's kind of an exciting announcement uh, I did apply to TD Friends of the Environment and got uh, approved for a, a funding for next year to run 10 uh, ward plantings similar to this using so I'll probably do five in the spring and five in the fall next year. And it'll be the same idea where we uh, work with uh, the Kevins and, uh, and the forestry department to find these little recip recipient sites that could house 10 to 40 trees, so not massive events, invite the adjacent neighbors, and then those neighbors plant the trees, but also learn a lot about the trees. So it won't be about qual uh, quantity, It'll be about quality, making sure that they uh, get the education and then they become the uh, stewards of those trees after. So I haven't formally announced that yet, but I thought you guys wanted to know that we got that funding. So that's a, that's a little bit of a bonus. Congratulations, that's incredible. Um, and if uh, you'd like to have a discussion with the committee at any point about you know, how we could support your work uh, on that, uh, let us know, let me and Brandy know if you'd like to have an agenda item put, put on for one of our meetings, okay, Andy? I will definitely. Awesome, thanks. Um, so I want to get to the the meeting schedule item because Brandy uh, wanted to have a conversation with us about our twenty twenty two meeting schedule. Uh, so Brandy, I'm not sure how you wanted to handle that. Yeah, no, not a problem. Um, seeing as it's basically coming to the conclusion of twenty twenty one, I just wanted to confirm if uh, the committee was good with the schedule as it is. 
um, basically the dates and times uh, once a month that we're having uh, the meeting. So I'm just looking to see if um, anybody has any different ideas for 2022 or if everybody's good for me to schedule 2022 as it remains now. Okay. Uh, it is it possible for us to maybe do a poll on that, like through email where everyone can provide their availability or? Absolutely. Do you think that's and then, the best way? Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, the next meeting, we can definitely discuss it. I'm just looking here. I have December 7th is the next meeting. So okay. I just figured I'd throw it out there now. And that way we can start getting the juices flowing. Yeah, I think it's reasonable to keep our December meeting date uh, intact. Uh, Sherry, did you have a thought on that? I'll participate in the survey that you send out. That's great. I'm comfortable with the schedule as it is, so I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, I just wanted to note, though, with things ramping up again with COVID immunization, I know I've been back here for a short time, but I'm sorry to say that I might be removed again to do some of that work. Um, so my participation might be a little bit intermittent, but I, I'll do my best. I can appreciate that for sure. No, it's uh, it's all good. That is important work. Um, okay, so we're, we're at the end of our meeting, um, and I just want to remind committee members, if you have agenda items, please reach out, um, and we can put that on for December or January, um, and look out for an email from Brandy on the meeting schedule, uh, look out for those slides on the Bradford EA, uh, and think of some comments you can bring forward. I think I'll put that as an agenda item for December, just so that it's a, a reminder for us to, to think about that. Um, and if you're interested in getting involved with that subcommittee on events, reach out to Kelly. Um, anything else anyone uh, needs to say? Sherry. Sorry, one last thing. Um, I noticed some great changes that had occurred on the City of Barrie's active transportation website content. Um, I, I don't know if Brett's team has been working on that, but I was uh, happy to see those changes. And I'm wondering if at some point in the future, we can have a little presentation on those changes and have a little discussion about maybe anything else that we can add, or has the committee already done that? Uh, so those changes were a result of a discussion we had at the committee, I think, oh. when you were uh, working away at immunization. Okay. But okay. Um, I think, I mean, it's a living website, right? So if, uh, if you have more suggestions, um, absolutely. I think uh, Brett and his team are open to, to, hearing, to hearing that. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, anything else before we, we head out? Not seeing anything. All right, I really appreciate everyone's time and thank you to staff, thank you, Brett, thank you, Brandy, uh, for being here. Uh, we appreciate your time as well. Okay, with that, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you so much, everyone, and take care. <laughs>